All right. Hi, eighth graders. Um, I'm just going to go over how to do your quarterly creative journal prompts. Um, the whole goal of doing this, if you didn't take seventh grade art last year, is to develop yourself creatively. Um, it's a good way for you to experiment artfully too. So that way, you know, if you want to try some different materials or something that maybe you wouldn't normally take the plunge on a big project or something, you can just experiment. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Um, it's a great way for you to practice art making on your own. I am not going to prescribe, other than giving you a prompt, how to do every single step of this. Um, I will give you plenty of suggestions. So those of you who maybe feel like you are struggling creativity and you don't really know where to go with a prompt, there will be things you can just kind of respond to. You can choose a plethora of the options. Um, but for those of you who really already like to kind of push yourself creatively, do that. Um, you do not have to follow the options. You just have to simply read the prompt and be inspired. So if you already feel moved to do that, then do that. Um, it's a great way for you to find your artistic voice doing these journal prompts. Um, we are going to be going over this semester um, a lot of different like modern art styles and modern art movements. If you took seventh grade art, you really studied the um, elements and principles of art. So we're going to look at some different influences. I am really into contemporary art, living artists. And I know it's probably really hard for you guys to even name a single living artist. I bet you could probably name a lot of dead ones. Um, so I want to introduce you to artists that are, you know, of your own time. So we're going to be looking at a few modern art movements that get us to what's popular today. All right, so what do you do? Well, first we move Mrs. Cantrell's face over here. Oh, good golly, okay. Oh, too many buttons, too many buttons, too many buttons, okay. Oh my gosh, too many buttons. Okay, there we go. Just touch and drag, touch and drag. There we go. So what do you do? You are going to be given six prompts. Um, they're all based off of artistic movements, styles, and forms. You're going to respond to each of those prompts creatively on a support of your choosing. That means you can use recycled book paper, you can use plain white paper, etc. Um please use whatever paper you have. Um, you can use some of the white paper that we've already bound inside of your journal. Um, you will also have some extra paper that we are giving you in a, um, in a little packet that we're going to tell you to store with your magazine. That'll make sense later. Um, the only paper you can't use in that, in that extra packet is the bigger sheet of, um, watercolor paper that you're going to be getting. So don't use that one. But everything else you can use if you wish. Just make sure you do save some papers for your other art assignments. Um, traditionally, when we do these journals, we work in recycled books. Um, and we do that because it forces you to think creatively. Traditionally, artists start with a blank canvas or a blank sketchbook. Um, if you are starting with something that's already printed on, then you have this extra challenge, this extra hurdle to work with. Um, so that's why we really like using some sort of recycled paper as your starting point. Um, but if that irritates you and aggravates you, don't do it. Uh, you can start on white paper and that would be fine. If you have something else at your house that you want to use, I'm also up for that. We just wanted to make sure you all had something to start with. That paper should be approximately the size of your paper, the rest of your papers that are in um, your art journal. However, it could be a little bit smaller because the size of a traditional book is a little bit smaller than that six by nine. So like around five by six would be good too. Um, the first thing you want to do is just read the prompt and look at the suggested resources. So I will go over some things in these slides and then brainstorm. You might need to, you know, kind of let some of your ideas simmer for a little bit. Then make your creative journal entry. 
just do it, make it happen. At the end of the quarter, submit all six of your creative journal entries on Canvas and respond to any additional questions about each prompt as necessary. So as we get closer to the end of the quarter, there will be an assignment that pops up there and that's where you hold up and take pictures of all um, six of your prompts. Um, like I said, some of your prompts will have some things to respond to and so you'll do that on there. Um, the following slides explain all six of your prompts and the art history behind them. Briefly, I'll try not to nerd out too much on you guys. Um, your job is to take inspiration from these art styles. Here's a variety of ways you can respond to the prompts. You can make an art parody, which if you know what a parody is, that's basically where you take something and you, um, I don't want to say make fun of it, but you sort of put a twist on it. You put some sort of like a humorous twist on it. So there's often parodies done of famous artworks. You can create a study of a famous artist's work. So if you find an artist on any of these slides, you're like, oh, that's really interesting. I'd like to learn more about Jasper Johns. I don't know. Um, then you can look into them and maybe find some, some of their work that you like and just basically copy it. That's what a study is um, when you're looking at another artist's work. And then make something completely original that is simply influenced by the prompt. So if I'm talking about a certain artist or movement, and you're like, oh, that gives me a really good idea, then just go with it. Just go with it, okay? Um, all right. So on this slide, I do want to point out that wherever you see the little, like, the little clicky hand, you can click on that on the slides presentation and that will take you to that prompt in the slides presentation um, because i realize that this has several slides on it um, so if you are working on your slides presentation at any point you're like oh i really just need to go to number four then you should be able to just move your cursor right here and go to it but these are your prompts and we're going to go through them one by one your first prompt is called impressionism and i would like to make my Head smaller here. Eh, okay. What is Impressionism? Impressionism is an early modern art movement that broke away from the academic tradition in Paris. I know you're like, I have no idea what that means. Basically, a long time ago, everybody thought that art had to look totally perfect and photorealistic because they didn't have cameras. So it was like magic for an artist to take out their paintbrush and make something look perfect just as you saw it in real life well once the camera came along that wasn't really so necessary so the impressionists were like hey why have we always tried to hide um the fact that we craft things by hand and so sculptors started to like leave their fingerprints and like their little smudgy marks inside of their clay and their um their plaster and painters were actually letting their brush strokes show. They were being very honest about the fact that they were painting um, and not trying to cover it up that they were painting. So the Impressionists really worked with that handmade quality. They valued that quality. So painters used really thick, heavy brush strokes instead of smooth, blended realism. Their paintings reflected impressions of life and not detailed realism. So who are the famous Impressionists? Here's a list that you could look up. Georges Seurat, Claude Monet, Edgar Degas, Bert Morisot, Mary Cassatt. Those two artists right there are females. So if you are really interested in studying female artists, check those ladies out. Um, and then we've got the Auguste, Auguste Renoir and Auguste Rodin. This is where I'm going to list some ideas. So if you go ahead and look at that previous slide and look at some of the artists and you find something that you that is really inspiring, just go with it. Um, but for those of you who are like, I have no idea what to do, this list is for you. Um, so what are some ideas I can use to respond to this prompt? You can start by just drawing anything you want, but use these techniques. Um, so these little pictures on the right, uh, the top one with the dots is called stippling. You can use that technique, use lots of different colors kind of blended together, and you will end up looking like you're making a Georges Seurat painting. Um, 
or you could do something that uses sort of like a really muddled brush technique. And I know we're not using a whole lot of paint this semester. Maybe some of you want to use paint at home, um, but you can also create that sort of brush texture just using colored pencils. Um, just rather than really smoothing it out, leave those little marks show. Um, the next thing you could do is you can draw something in plein air which is a French term that means to just go out in nature and draw. So that is a common practice that Impressionists did. They would take their easels and sketchbooks outside and draw out in nature, or they would go to a local cafe and draw the people around them. Um, so you can do the same thing. If you just wanna use this like sketchbook practice and just go out and draw something as it is happening in front of you, I think that'd be great. Another thing you could do is find an impressionist work of art that you like and make your own study of it. So basically observe it and recreate it. Your study may not be as detailed. So I'm looking at this picture right here by Renoir. There's a lot of people in there. So if your study was a little bit more simplified or if you wanted to hone in on just a few characters, a few figures, that would be okay. Um, but I do have attached to all of these links right here. Um, some of them go to videos that show some interesting facts about that art. Um, some of them go to some web pages. And that's just a starting point. So if you click on these Monet water lilies here and you're like, oh, that's really pretty. Oh, I've always wanted to go to Paris. And you, and you learn about that, then you can go out and do some more research on the Googles if you wish. Um, the last idea here for Impressionism is my favorite, make a parody of a famous Impressionist painting. Um, so I did reference one of my favorite parodies from one of my favorite shows. The Office recreated a famous Georges Seurat painting. It's called Sunday on Le Grand Jot. Um, and then I also found another awesome SpongeBob parody of the same painting. Um, so you can do some research on the internet just like Google famous impressionist paintings, you're gonna find a bunch of a bunch of paintings. Um, and as you look through them, if you're like, oh, it'd be really cool if I did that, but with The Simpsons, you could do something like that. That's that's a parody. Okay, so that is your first prompt. Your second prompt is called abstract expressionism. Um, this is one that's going to look very easy. It might be very easy. Um, but I want you to understand and appreciate some of the history that comes behind it. What is abstract expressionism? Abstract expressionism is an American art movement that was popular during the mid 20th century. Their paintings were often spontaneous and created with a lot of movement and feeling. Um, this link right here takes you to a scene from one of my favorite movies called Pollock. Um, it's some of you may have heard of Jackson Pollock before. He's the guy who's famous for dripping paint, paint splattering. Uh, he created this background image that you see in front of you. And before he was called Jack the Dripper, um, he was basically just a spontaneous abstract painter. And you can see in this clip, um, it's a it's a dramatic portrayal of him. It's sort of a recreation, but you can see how it's going to lead up to that, um, that dripping of the paint. But it's a great, great clip. Who are famous abstract expressionists? Here's a brief list. There are more. Um, what's interesting is the first two are kind of paired husband and wife. So Jackson Pollock and his wife, Lee Krasner, who I love. Willem de Kooning and his wife, Elaine de Kooning. Um, Arshiel Gorky and Mark Rothko and Joan Mitchell. What's interesting is that all these people, as you look at their artwork, they're very... They look very simple. Um, like a Mark Rothko painting is usually just like three blocks of color or so. Um, but those paintings, the paintings from this movement, I kid you not, sell for hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, a Mark Rothko painting recently sold at a Christie's auction for more than a hundred million dollars. 
So what I think is really interesting is why, um, and I don't have enough time to get into that in this video, but maybe you'll fall down the rabbit hole and start looking at some of the prices of what these things sell for. Okay, so here are your ideas if you need them about what you can do. Sorry, I'm running dry. <clears throat> so um, the first simplest thing is to make something spontaneous and creative um, that uses a lot of movement. That's the other thing about abstract expressionism is like it should sort of like reflect the movement of what you're feeling. If you're feeling anxious and energetic, then your the movement of your line should feel anxious and energetic. If you're feeling kind of calm and subdued, then you should have nice wavy lines that match that mood. So you can create something that's called non-objective artwork using those feelings. Non-objective artwork has no object in it. So if you look at these, uh, these paintings here by Joan Mitchell, they are not pictures of anything. They're just squiggly, smudgy lines. Um, they're just colors and, and lines and marks that she felt like making. That is the essence of abstract expressionism. <clears throat> Next thing. This might seem a little, a little hokey. I don't know. But if you are looking for a way to relax, this prompt could give you the the excuse you're looking for. Um, if you watch the clip that I had on the last slide of Jackson Pollock painting this mural, you're going to notice that he didn't paint anything for months. Um, and it seemed like he was sort of like meditating on this blank canvas the entire time. I don't expect you to take months meditating on a blank piece of paper. But maybe set a time for you to kind of zone out and meditate for 10 minutes to an hour. I don't know. I don't know how much time, free time you have. And then after you pull yourself out of that med meditation, create whatever you feel like creating. Um, so maybe have some things handy nearby for when you um, set out to do this meditation thing. So there's an option for you. Another option, <laughs> I love this, Willem de Kooning. Willem de Kooning paints ugly women. <laughs> he just, he paints women in a very bizarre, brute way. Um, so if you were going to take the sort of parody approach here, you could draw some other figure. Um, in a very Willem de Kooning style. If you click on this picture, I think it takes you to a little video where they talk about um, his women paintings. So you can see some other ones. It's pretty easy to do a little Google search and find some more. Um, but I don't know, it'd be kind of funny to see like Mrs. Puff from SpongeBob drawn in that style. <laughs> mm -mm. All right, so this is another one of your choose your own adventures. And just a reminder, like you don't have to do all of these things. These are just options. These are just, if you need ideas, here are some things you can do to respond to this abstract expressionism prompt. Um, study one of the abstract expressionists and try to recreate a work in their style. And it might be harder than you think. So um, here's that Mark Roth go guy I was talking about. <clears throat> it's got like the three bands of color that looks like it'd be super easy and I'm sure you could recreate it and have it look pretty similar to that however click on that picture and watch the video um there's a guy in the museum that does a really interesting demonstration in that video of how Mark Rothko actually paints these rather large panels um and it's it's not a simple process. It's actually a very layered process. So it would be interesting if you're going to go this route to maybe try to recreate something very similar using that same process. Um, the Jackson Pollock video over here does the same thing where they talk about the uh, methods he used for dripping his paint. Um, this large painting in the center is my favorite painting at the, uh, Cleveland Art Museum. And that is a Lee Krasner painting. And perhaps why I love it is because when it's on the wall, it's this 
great big mammoth painting and then on a tiny wall in the corner next to where it's located is a much smaller Jackson Pollock painting. If you remember I said they were married um, and usually Lee Krasner did not get very much of the spotlight but in this particular museum she does and so I very much appreciate that. All right moving on to your third prompt. Formalism and minimalism. They're basically focused, they're two terms that kind of focus on the same thing. Um, and this is the best way I can explain it. Much like how scientists explore human anatomy to figure out the wonders of the human body, artists explore the anatomy of painting and sculpting in the 1900s to understand the wonders of art. These movements gave birth to the very elements and principles of design that we study today. As the name suggests, most formalist and minimalist works are very simple and clean, but they are arranged thoughtfully and methodically using balance, color theory, I can't see what the rest of this says. <laughs> uh, oh, there we go. Using balance, color theory, and the most basic elements of design. So the background here is a P.A. Mondrian painting, which is probably one of the more classic examples of um, formalism. He was part of a Swedish group called the Dristeil movement. Who are famous abstract expressionists? Here's a nice list for you. Frank Stella I put on top because he's my personal favorite. The neat thing about Frank Stella is if you look at his career, he starts off very simple and minimalistic. But if you look at the things that he has done recently, because he is actually still alive, his artwork has like exploded. He's got things coming out of the wall. Things are huge and layered. And there's all sorts of messy textures and stuff. It's interesting. So I very much appreciate him. Donald Judd, Dan Flavin, Sola Witt, Joseph Albers, and P.A. Mondrian are good ones to look up here. Formalism and minimalism. What are some of the ideas I can use to respond to this prompt? First thing you can do is pull out some techniques you may have learned in Miss Greer's pre-engineering class, um, and you can create a Donald Judd-like sculpture using paper and the pop-up technique that you learned last year. Um, so this picture allows you to click on it and it takes you to a YouTube video where if you have not made a pop-up in that way, um, it's a really simple video where a lady shows you how to make like a pop-up city. But you can use that technique to create something that looks like this metal sculpture out of paper. Um, the next thing you could do is find an image you like and then draw what it would look like if it was reduced down to flat, basic geometric shapes. Uh, let me move my face out of the way for a second. So um, a lot of, I don't know, pop culture things do this. Like you can get on the computer and find minimalist versions of a lot of your favorite characters. Um, I just Googled minimalist uh, Avengers and this collage popped up. You can see it has the essence of who the Avengers are, but it's very watered down. It doesn't have all the details of um, their faces and eyes and things like that. Um, how you get to something like that is like this example on the very bottom with the cow. <laughs> it's by an artist named Theo Van Doesburg. And Theo Van Doesburg just basically broke down an actual picture of a cow so it was abstracted. So you can do something like that where you take a picture of something you love or just something you like and find interesting and just break it down. Um, so rather than having these um, really organic shapes within the cow, it gets kind of harshened up into these uh, angles and then the artist flatten it out with those just flat shapes of color and that uh, helps it to now look like a minimalist cow. So you can do something like that. My face back over here. Another option here is you can create an image of your choice but use only Mondrian's famous color palette, red, yellow, blue, black, and white. Make sure it is flat and graphic. I have two examples here. 
at the top is there is Katy Perry because she did a music video completely in Mondrian style. And then I included a cute little minion done in Mondrian style. You could take just about anything you want and do a similar thing, reducing things down to this Mondrian style. Uh, the next one might excite some of you. Minimalism lends itself very well to pixel art. Um, so if you want to create something, if you have perler beads at home, um, or if you just want to do this on the graph paper that you provided in your little journal packet, this would be great. You can create something of, of your choosing um, and do it in a pixeled format. So I've got some Minecraft ideas there for you. And like with the other ones, there are three different um, pictures you can click on here. If you simply just want to study an, one of these artists, one of these artworks, and then, um, you know, recreate it, that'd be cool. You could do that. Hmm. Moving right along. <clears throat> Participatory art. This one is more of a general theme in contemporary art. The theme I very much love. Um, what is participatory art? Well, participatory art is a relatively recent term given to modern art, and it blurs the boundaries between artist and viewer. In particip participatory art, the artist invited the viewer. I guess you could say invites. The artist invites the viewer to do something with the art um, and not to just look at it. So in the background here, I have posted this picture of a giant pile of candy. And you can go to museums such as the um, Chicago Art Institute, and you can see this a very similar pile of candy where you are invited to go and take a piece of candy. That's the art. The art is this giant 200 pound uh, pile of candy, and you can take a piece. And then that's it. That's the art. They share candy with you. There's a whole explanation behind it. Again, I don't have enough time in this video to go over it, though I would love to. So if you want to ask me about the pile of candy sometime, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, but the point is, the art isn't so much a, about looking at it and enjoying it. It's about participating in it, taking the candy and having the candy. Um, so that artist is the top one that I put on here. His name is Felix ugh, Felix Gonzalez Torres. Um, some of you might recognize the next name, Yoko Ono. If you're a Beatles fan, you know that she was married to um, their singer, John Lennon. She is a contemporary artist, and she does some pretty outrageous, weird things. Um, but lately, she's into doing these installations where you can, like, write little wishes on pieces of paper and then hang the paper on a tree. Um, the next artist, Marina Abramovich, is someone that I love very dearly. And if you were to ever see some of her work from early in her career, you would scratch your head and think, this lady isn't right. Um, and maybe she's not, I don't know. But lately she's been doing some really interesting participatory performances. Um, in 2010, she did one at the MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, where she sat in a chair um, for three months during all the open hours in the museum, never moved from the chair while the museum was open, and she invited viewers to sit across from her in the other empty chair. So that was the art. She sat in a chair, and the uh, audience could come sit in the other chair. That was it. Um, Yoyoi Kusama, if you took art last year when we went into lockdown, um, you studied this artist. She does some really cool installation pieces, um, but she often has a participatory room um, called an obliteration room where you get to take little dot stickers and put them all over the place. So you help to make the art. And then Andy Goldsworthy, um, he does some participatory participatory things um, that take up 
big, vast amounts of space. Um, so there'll be like fences and things that kind of run through um, big areas that you can kind of walk through. But the neat thing about him is he uses all natural materials, things that are found in nature. Okay, so this is the only slide I have for this one because it's pretty simple. What you need to do is just make something in your journal that your viewer can interact with. Um, I said here, like a children's book, maybe it requires your viewers to do any of these things. Lift flaps, play a game, arrange pieces, color a picture, take something away, um, connect something virtual. The catch is that you must make the art and it must already look interesting on its own. Um, you cannot ask the viewer to make the project for you because I know some of you smarty pants would try to make that happen. So you still have to make something, but you need to make something that the audience can participate in. So I included this picture here. It might be hard to read the note, um, but a few years ago, a student submitted this and it had all these little piece, plastic pieces of a cut up water bottle that were attached to a string. Um, and the note says to basically take the piece, um, and he had written something underneath the note. And if you looked through that color, um, it would make certain messages appear and disappear. So I thought that was really awesome and creative. Um, he did it with recycled materials, but it's playful and it's something for you to participate in. So it's not just something where I opened this book and said, oh, wow, this is really nice. It's something that I got to play with and, you know, become part of the art. Next, word art. Words and contemporary art. Since the early 1900s, art has taken many different forms. If you look around a contemporary art exhibit today, you are bound to see a blurry line between literature and fine art, as so many visual artists now use the written word as a way to create works of art. So who are some famous word artists? There are a great many. This is just a highlighted list I put together for you. Um, John Baldessari, who actually did the background image here that says, I will not make any more boring art. I will not make any more boring art. I will not make any more boring art. Funny. Um, Banksy, who is like one of my favorite graffiti artists, but a lot of his work contains text in it. Barbara Kruger, who's a photographer, um, those of you who are a fan of the Supreme brand, they totally ripped her style, by the way. Um, but if you look at a Barbara Kruger photograph, it has text on top of it that looks very much like the, the red background with the white letters that Supreme uses. Those are her words. Um, not, not her words, but that's her font. Um, so Barbara Kruger does some really powerful, like, in-your-face messages about consumerism, uh, Joseph Kosuth is a more of a conceptual artist. Uh, he makes things that just make you think. The Gorilla Girls, I have an example of them coming up. Lawrence Weiner is a guy who just makes words. Um, I remember when I first started teaching, I did a project where kids had to basically come up with some sort of like head scratching phrase, just like he does, and they had to display it throughout the building. Um, it was just, if you look up his work, it's really just big, bold words, but nothing really makes sense. <laughs> um, and then Bruce Noman is a um, an artist who works in neon lights. Um, so he has some really neat messages that just light up. And I do want to say, because there's another neon artist coming up on a different slide, if any of you have any experience with LED lights, especially if you took pre-engineering, I do have some LED light materials, like the batteries and the LED lights and some wire. Um, so if you are ever interested in borrowing those materials to make something for your journal, I think that is wicked cool. I've had a handful of people do that in the past. Um, so just let me know if you're gonna go the Bruce Noman route and do something that lights up. Um, but here's some ideas for you. And I have some student examples block out poetry. I'm going to say block out instead of blackout because your block out poetry does not have to be black. It can be colorful. But an interesting way to recycle the book pages and to um, incorporate words into a work of art is this really neat idea of block out poetry. And there's so many ideas on the internet 
there are really cool videos you can watch about how to do this and how to do this creatively. I cannot stress that enough. Creatively. It is not creative to circle a few words and then completely black out the rest, but it is creative to do what this artist did and make some sort of image around it, to put some sort of pattern around it, make it engaging to look at, not just to read. Um, another thing you can practice with this prompt is graffiti writing. Uh, this is actually a Banksy piece that I have here. You can write your name or a message in a graffiti style of your choice. Large balloon letters, just so you know, are called a throw up. Um, so if you're looking for um, graffiti text, uh, that's the kind of like kind of big funky letters you would look for, throw up letters. And if you wanted to make some sort of quick slap, like a logo, uh, it's called a slap. So you can do that. Another thing I'd encourage you to do, because I know some of you have some very strong ideas about some things, um, use this as an opportunity to deliver a message. Uh, like the Gorilla Girls who made this work of art here, you can use your art as a platform to speak your mind about important issues. I had some students who did that last year when we started doing um, activities on Canva, and it was really great. Um, I love this message where the Gorilla Girls say, do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? And then there's um, some facts there that say less than 5% of the artists in the modern art sections are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. Hmm, it's a really interesting little factoid there. But they do a lot of advocacy for um, gender equality and things like that. Uh, all of their posters have that gorilla head on them. That's sort of like their little signature. Uh, another thing you can do, I love watching these kinds of videos on Instagram like all the time, you can do creative hand lettering. You can write a quote or message in a unique font by hand. This is just an example I found on the interwebs. There are tons of examples out there, um, but this would be a good way for you to practice some creative hand lettering if you wish. The last prompt I have for you is another art style and it's called pop art. A pretty popular movement, so maybe you've heard of it before. Um, pop art is an art movement that gained a lot of popularity towards the end of the 20th century and remains popular today. Pop artists use popular, let's <laughs> say popping a lot, um, popular commercial icons, images, celebrities, and products as inspiration for their fine art. Um, who are famous pop artists? Uh, Andy Warhol, for sure. Roy Lichtenstein, who actually did the uh, image that's in the back here, the very comic book looking picture. Takashi Murakami is a um, contemporary artist. Um, he is a Japanese pop artist. Um, I guarantee if you look up his work, you're going to immediately recognize some of his icons, which are these very like kawaii style um smiley faces with like flowers around them. Jasper Johns is another interesting dude. Klaus Oldenburg, who did, if you like sculpture, that's a really fun one to study. Um, I put a link here. I would recommend doing it. It doesn't take very long, um, but I think it's on the Tate website. They have a quiz um, and it tells you what pop artist you are. So I took the quiz and apparently I'm Pauline Bodie, and I've never even heard of that lady before, so now I'm excited to do a little deep dive and figure out who she is. Um, but if you're looking for someone interesting to be inspired by, take that quiz. All right, here are some things you can do to respond to this prompt if you're like, I have no idea what to do. You can take a product or logo that you enjoy and repeat that image in a grid, change the colors if you wish. Um, so I used the example here of Andy Warhol's Marilyn Monroe. Um, and the picture on the bottom is a student example who did sort of a similar thing, changing those very vivid colors. It's a very graphic layout, um, but instead of Marilyn Monroe, it is the Apple logo. You can also create or copy an image in the style of a cartoon or comic book. I personally love studying frames from graphic novels. So the bottom one is actually a painting that I did, um, copying a little bit out of the Watchmen uh, graphic novel. Um, but the other two pictures are student examples in their journals. Um, and they have that really graphic 
comic book look to them. You can also just, like with all the others, select a, an artist from the first slide or take the quiz that was on that previous slide um, and do a study of their work, create something in their style. And the last thing, which might be exciting to some of you, is you can make fan art. Basically anything that, it, that references your favorite music, shows, movies, YouTubers, things that are popular today um, or that were popular once upon a time, like the Beatles, those are things you can use for this, um, for this prompt. So I know that was a really long video, but that's it. Um, hopefully after you have watched this, you might have been like, oh, I have some ideas. You don't have to start with number one and work to number six. You can work in whatever order you want. Um, really, your journal hopefully should be a project that makes you happy. Um, if you are creating something that doesn't make you happy, then find something that does, because uh, you have a lot of creative freedom here. I'm just giving you a starting point, but it's a pretty wide web that I have cast out for you about what you are allowed to do. You just basically have to defend how you got from the prompt point A to your artwork point B. That's it. Um, so I hope you enjoy. You can use whatever materials you want, the ones that we have provided. If you have other things at home you'd like to use, you are welcome to it. Um, so have fun, kids, and I can't wait to see what you made.